getting into the latest news on the whole um, phone hacking situation. You know, the top police chief of Scotland Yard stepped down over the weekend. The head of uh, News Corps over in the UK was arrested. Uh, now, the head of the Metropolitan Police, the police commissioner, uh, has also uh, been forced to step down uh, due to connections to reported bribery. And uh, this is how the whole thing works. And there's a lot of uh, old news coming out now, resurfacing, about uh, News of the World hooked into British intelligence and military intelligence uh, digging up dirt on politicians during the 1990s. And this is basically like WikiLeaks, but an old tech version of it where different branches of government want to uh, uh, sabotage each other uh, generally so they can climb the ladder and get into power. It's, it's all part of backstabbing. And so instead of having WikiLeaks release information uh, to, to uh, you know, engage in infighting, uh, they would have News of the World and, and other tabloids uh, do it. And of course, the Metropolitan Police are involved. Of course, Scotland Yard is involved. Of course, British intelligence is involved. And this is a Labor Party backed up by BBC fight uh, against the Tories, uh, backed up by News Corp that is taking over the media. Uh, and BBC is scared and has literally a, a fraction of the listeners and viewers uh, they had just a decade ago. And so this is an attempt to keep state-run media in charge. Um, either way, it's bad. I mean, you've got the neocon arm and you've got the liberal Fabian socialist arm and they're just running around fighting with each other. Uh, but uh, make no mistake that uh, at the end of the day here, this is nothing but an internal fight going on. And uh, you know George Soros is heavily hooked up with the Labor Party, Gordon Brown, the globalist, the, 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 the Fabian socialist. On the U.S. front, uh, we have had Media Matters uh, now reportedly uh, over a year ago, but it came out a few months ago in Politico. Uh, the documents, the memos for Media Matters saying we will physically infiltrate News Corps, Fox News. We will sabotage it. We will destroy it. We will go in and get employed there, and we will sabotage them. And that is espionage. Uh, and that's publicly admitted, and I pointed that out at the time that it was criminal. And pointed out that if anybody else did this, it would be illegal. What do you think Fox News and its European subsidiaries are doing? They're phone hacking. They're breaking in. They're tracking politicians. They're getting fed dirt by police as part of a political manipulation. And that's illegal. And they should be punished for it. But media matters is on record with that memo that they openly bragged about once it got leaked, probably by them, because it's a positive article in Politico, and, and that's a tactic. They knew this was going to come out, so they had Politico come out and report on it like it was a wonderful, cutesy thing to do. Oh, look, they're going to infiltrate. Oh, look, they're going to get into uh, News Corps uh, and, and destroy them from within. I mean, that's illegal. I mean, if a memo came out that say, I, I had people working for me at InfoWars, and I said, let's get jobs at the Austin American Statesman, and let's, let's, let's dig up dirt on them internally, and, but also let's sabotage them. Our mission is to destroy them. I would be arrested for racketeering organized crime. And I should be. That is racketeering. That is organized crime. Uh, that is sabotage. Uh, if I climb the fence, hypothetically, say, you know, let's say I had a company that sold natural gas and I had trucks that went around town. And if I climbed the fence of my competitor in the middle of the night and went in and sabotaged equipment and then called in safety violations uh, to the state board that deals with safety and then had them shut down for a few days, and it was in the news that they had safety violations and they lost customers. If I was caught, I would be charged with organized crime, racketeering, and sabotage. Okay, these are serious, hardcore felonies. If you did that, you would be. In fact, I meant to do it yesterday. I'm going to cover this more later in the broadcast, coming up in the third hour. I'm going to reprint that Politico because I... I want to read from the memo itself. I forget the exact headline. It was, if you want to pull it up, it was something like uh, Media Matters Memo. Infiltrate Fox News, destroy it from within. And you can pull up the uh, Politico article that has the memo in it. 
And, and so my point is, yeah, there it is, Media Matters War Against Fox, and uh, that came out that came out a few months ago. And you can just pull that article up. That was from March 26, so I guess four or five months ago. Time flies. And so there it is. We're going to print that and later cover it. So that's what I had to say about this. Prosecute Rupert Murdoch to the fullest extent of the law. But at the same time, we need to see a prosecution of George Soros's outfit, Media Matters. I mean, the thing is tax exempt when they are a ardent political arm of the Obama administration on record and brag that they get walking orders and marching orders from the White House. And they're funded by George Soros and they're saying infiltrate and destroy media companies. That's what's going on with News Corp. Now, now I told you last week, over a week ago, in fact, it'd be great if YouTubers, you know, on the Alex Jones channel would uh, pull up that because I don't have the stat to sit there and show you every week how I was right last week. And I said, listen, this goes a lot deeper with what's happening at News Corp. It's an internal fight. If you're in good stead with the globalist, they will let you engage basically in bloody murder. It's impossible to get in trouble. This is an internal fight. And I said, don't make no mistake, major corporations, Fortune 100 especially, most of them are bigger than the, than the GDPs of major nations. Out of the top 100 GDPs, over 15, pull up the numbers, Forbes reports on every year, over 50 are corporations, not countries. They have mercs, they have spies, they have sex operatives, they have hitmen. In most major cities, uh, good old boys that run the town have hitmen. It isn't just Italian mafia. There's uh, plenty of f wealthy old families in Austin. I mean, LBJ had hitmen when he was in Congress. But I'm not going to get off into all that right now. The point is, is that this is how the real world works. And I told you there were going to be hitmen involved over a week ago, repeatedly. I said, they've got hitmen, and if this continues, there's going to be deaths. Well... What's in the Daily Mail? What is in BBC? <sighs> Someone's coming to get me, terrified phone hacking whistleblower, feared for his life before he was found dead. That's right. And it goes on. The man who launched the entire phone hacking scandal had become paranoid. Oh, see, so he's paranoid. It's like looking both ways at a four-way stop. That's not paranoia. That's common sense. A paranoid recluse who believes someone was out to get him, a friend has revealed. Sean Hoare, who was found dead in his flat in Watford yesterday, had spent much of the last week of his life hiding in his flat with the curtains drawn. Told folks they're coming to get me, just like Diana said. Prince Charles told me he's going to kill me in a fake auto accident. Favorite way of Western intelligence to kill you. Well, they have the movie Syriana based on Bob Bear. He's, he's telling the guy who wants you to kill him. He goes, I want you to drug him, put him in a car, and run a truck into it. That's a true story. I want you to drug him, put him in a car, run a truck into him. She told the butler that. She shot a video. Scotland Yard confiscated it, but they didn't get her diary. It's in her diary. What did Hutton say? What did the Hutton inquiry say about Dr. David Kelly, the head weapons inspector, who said it's all a lie about WMDs? He sent an email to friends and colleagues saying, I've been told I'll be found dead in the woods. They murdered him, better than a hammer, found dead in the woods. Slit rest, no blood at the scene. We're going to come back with this. Now, who murdered this guy? This guy's now been dead since yesterday morning in England. And within 20 minutes of them announcing they'd found the dead body, the police walked out to the press cordon and said, we don't think there's any foul play. Okay, a guy is telling his neighbors and everybody that they're out to get him. He's scared for his life. He's the person that blew the whistle and said, no, this goes directly to the head of News of the World, who himself openly works for David Cameron. Okay? Now, he's dead. And the police out of the gate say, uh, we don't think that there's anything suspicious about this. How asinine is that? And of course, the police, you have the police chief of, of London, incredibly powerful position, the commissioner resigning. You have the head of Scotland Yard uh, resigning, one of the oldest law enforcement agencies in the world. 
You have all this going on, and a guy at the center of it's dead, and the police say nothing to see here, move along. And there's articles out calling people conspiracy theorists today in the news if you think this is suspicious. There's news saying it's suspicious and that you're a conspiracy theorist if you think the big pharma head's girlfriend being found bound and gagged hanging from the front balcony four days after the son fell down the stairs and died later. Two people die at a house in a week. And the police say, no foul play. Hanging from a rope, bound and gagged. And I've seen it in Austin. This Palestinian activist professor, gutted, wrist slit, bound with duct tape, mouth, hands, legs, thrown into the water, into the Colorado River, in downtown Austin. And the police said, oh, yeah, he bound himself and did all this and threw himself in. That's who runs America. That's who runs America. We need to stop being little children. This is who runs England. Stop being naive about government. The man who launched the entire phone hacking scandal has become a paranoid recluse. He was paranoid. He's dead now. He's a conspiracy theorist. He's evil. Who believes someone was out to get him. He's dead now. But he's, you know, a friend has revealed Sean Hoare, who was found dead at his flat in Watford yesterday, had spent much of the last week of his life hiding in his flat with the curtains drawn. Last night, a friend and neighbor claimed Matt Hoare, 47, had become increasingly reclusive and paranoid in recent weeks. He would talk about someone from the government coming to get him. He'd say to me, if anyone comes by, don't say I'm in. He was physically going downhill. He was yellow in color and wasn't looking well for the last month. He had a constant struggle with alcohol and talked to me about how much he had put his wife through. He did say something about phone hacking, and I think that was his main worry. Yeah, no kidding. He was had definite concerns with the media. He did mention he was paranoid and would mention conspiracy stuff. See, conspiracy. He's at the center of something that is very probably going to bring down the prime minister of the United Kingdom. The two head police chiefs in the country have had to resign. They've arrested the head of News Corp. There's bribery scandals, intelligence ops, spying on parliament, all of this coming... David Cameron runs to South Africa. All of this is going on, and you are a conspiracy theorist if you are the guy that released all this info and is the key witness, the key witness, and you tell people they're out to get you and you die. Princess Diana said, Charles told me he's going to kill me in a fake auto accident in a video and in a diary. Scotland Yard raided on record, got the video, not the diary. It got out. That diary is public and, is, and has been out for many years. Newspapers have reported on it. Charles told me he's going to kill me in a fake auto accident. That'd be like if I said, my wife told me that if I don't shape up, I'm going to be uh, uh, found uh, dead in the lake. And then I'm found dead in the lake. And there's a video and a diary. Uh, oh, they're not going to question my wife. I mean, this is incredible, ladies and gentlemen. Same thing with the Hutton inquiry. It came out that Dr. David Kelly, head weapons inspector, said there's no WMDs. He was going to testify. He told his friends, I'm going to end up dead in the woods, I've been told, but I don't care. I'm going to tell the truth. People walk up in the park at dawn, see five men in black uniforms, or was it four, run away from his body. This is on record. The police come and say, nothing to worry about. He slit his wrist, no blood at the scene. Then it was, oh, he took pills, two undigested pills. They murdered him. They murdered him, and he said they were going to murder him, but still the police say it's suicide. The key so there whistleblower at the heart of the hacking scandal and bribery scandal that threatens to bring down the British government. And he says, people are after me. I've got to hide out. I'm in danger. There's a government conspiracy dealing with the hacking. He's found dead. The cops, within 20 minutes, walk out and tell the media, no foul play. We don't think anything's going on before an investigation was even done. Go away. That's always the sign. Oh, we just found the Pulitzer Prize winner who wrote about the government drug dealing. We had a new book coming out in a few months. We just found him shot twice in the back of the head. In California, at his home, uh, he told folks people were breaking in his house and threatening him, but uh, uh, we believe it's normal to shoot yourself twice in the head. 
it'd be hard enough to be able to bring a hammer down on your on your fingers once, much less twice. Can you imagine trying to shoot yourself in the in the in the in the first the back of the head and, and then blew his jaw off in the side of the face with a shotgun? Can you imagine? I'm tough. I can shoot myself once with a shotgun, and I'm so tough with that I then I then I shoot myself in the face. That's how tough I am. Let me shoot myself in the back of the head here. Let me and then, and then let me shoot myself from the side and blow my whole jaw off. Cause I'm tough. Yeah. Princess Diana, Dr. David Kelly. Now this poor whistleblower. They come out and they say, I've been told I'm going to get killed. Someone's coming to get me. There's a conspiracy over this whole hacking situation. Oh, gee, he's the key witness in everything. No one would think anything of him just suddenly dying. No, no. And they actually say, you know, in the articles, there's a whole bunch out today. Don't be a conspiracy theorist, okay? You know, if uh, a kid falls down the stairs and dies, and four days later, the woman who was watching the child, the girlfriend is found hanging from a balcony, bound and gagged, hand and feet, dead. And the police, within minutes, come out and say, no foul play, move along. We're not, we don't think this is suspicious. That, that, that's normal. That's normal. Don't be a conspiracy theorist, okay? Governments never kill people. It's like that line in The Godfather 1 where uh, Al Pacino uh, character is talking to his girlfriend, and she says, come on, Michael, that's ridiculous. Presidents and senators don't have people killed. And he says, oh, who's being naive now, Kate? Oh, come on, Michael. Come on, Michael. Because you know, she knows he's been involved in killing people to protect his dad. And she says, Michael, it's terrible that they're killing people. It's horrible. And he says, Kate, that's how things are done. That's how presidents and senators operate. And she says, Michael, presidents and senators don't do things like that. And he says, who's being naive now, Kate? Stop being naive. They're going to kill me. I'm hiding out in my house. I'm the main witness. Bringing the whole government down. Dead. <laughs> Please come out. Okay, news media. Nothing Nothing to see here. No foul play. Move along. <laughs> yeah. You know, back in the uh, early 90s, it was a joke when you'd get Arkansas with your arms, legs, head cut off, and they'd say it was a suicide. Or shot off the road, you know, hundreds of bullets in the car. I wanted to get into eugenics from the perspective of what's being done to black Americans. I've talked to NAACP people. I have talked to, quote, liberal black activists. And they say, I don't want to discuss black abortion because it's a sacrament for them. And I say, so if cops beat up a black gangbanger, uh, that's a big freak out. Everybody weeps and wails and gnashes their teeth. But if 51 to 52 percent of blacks are never born in this country, Oh, that's a wonderful, great thing. Okay. And you need to know the history of Margaret Sanger and the liberal movement. They said, we'll pose as liberals in public letters so we can kill these weeds. Those are quotes. Get rid of these weeds. Now, you need to expand on that. And, and we're going to our guest here. Uh, we have a whole article uh, up on it today at uh, prisonplanet.com. Uh, but here it is. Beckham's a bad example for families. That's the big uh, football star, soccer star. And uh, the, the very groups lecturing them saying there should be a law against having more than two children. They're the ones that have five children or more like Ted Turner. So we'll be uh, talking more about that. This is a larger agenda. That's what the bisphenol A and the plastics is about. We have the government documents on that. We're going to be going over all of it uh, today. Uh, but uh, I take you now to Mark Crutcher. Who I appreciate holding while I was ranting. And uh, he's a pro-life movement full-time, well-known national spokesman, uh, ldi.org, lifedynamics.com. And he's got a syndicated radio show. He's on in Dallas, makes documentary films. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to belabor his long uh, bio. But the point is um, that if you don't like government-run health care, they say you're a racist. Chris Matthews says that. And Carlos Watson, nothing to do with it. They play the race card. The truth is, at the end of the day, if you hang out with real mainline establishment liberals, they're really control freak Nazis who will giggle and laugh at you and admit they hate black people. I don't know if that's what Matthews thinks personally or Watson, but the people I've run into 
including some black folks, think we need to kill blacks. I mean, th I mean, this is a sacrament. Uh, and uh, Mr. Crusher, do you agree with that analysis? Absolutely. They see um, abortion. Uh, well, first off, you have to back up a little bit. These eugenicists, uh, who most people think don't exist anymore, but they actually do. You know, it's kind of like um, from a spiritual standpoint, I've always said that one of the greatest tricks that was ever played by Satan is that he convinced people he doesn't exist. That gives him free reign to do whatever he wants to do. Eugenicists are in the same situation. These eugenicists have convinced people that eugenics is something that, that died with the Nazis, when in reality it's more prevalent today than it's ever been. And these people are what I call the moneyed elite, the uh, Ted Turners, the Bill and Melinda Gateses, the George Soros, Warren Buffett, T. Boone Pickens. These people believe that the world belongs to them and that the rest of us are just kind of interlopers who they can decide to let stay or not let stay. Oprah Winfrey, it's been in mainstream news that they, quote, meet secretly to discuss a, quote, global government to forcibly reduce population. That's Times of London. We'll put that up. Absolutely. They, they believe that they have the right to sit down in a room somewhere w with their fellow travelers and decide not only which individuals get to live and die, but which entire races of people are allowed to live and which ones will be forced to die. And it is a frightening world that we live in because the American people have become anesthetized to all this stuff, and they're more concerned about who's going to play in the Super Bowl next year than they are any of these kind of issues. Uh, you know, I could go on, on the streets downtown Dallas today, or you could, Alex, and we could stand there and talk about things that we have absolute irrefutable proof that are going on. And 90% like these things, and 90% of the things people that walk by would totally ignore us. But we, if we were standing there talking about the Dallas Cowboys or the Dallas Mavericks or, you know, the New York Yankees or something, we'd have people lined up around the block wanting to talk. And I think that these globalists, these these eugenics people, the, the people who, who see the world as their, as their playground, I think that to some degree they may have consciously created this situation in which they've anesthetized the public. Oh, no, they've written a bunch of books. Edward Bernays, uh, I mean, there's scores of books where they brag in the 20s and 30s that they were setting up this system where people will love their servitude and, and, and where they arrest the development of men and women where people are in a childlike state for all of life and giggle at anything serious. Absolutely. That's where we are. Uh, that's where we are as a, as a, as a country. Uh, that's where the world is. is, is has, has Actually, we're following the rest of the world into, over the abyss. If you tell a lot of black people this, who are bought into the system especially, they'll say, oh, shut up, you're making that up. You're probably a racist. I mean, you're going 52% of you are never born. This is a plan. They say that they want to kill you as weeds. They said they would pose as liberals, and a lot of black folks are so wedded to worshiping Obama, they don't even want to listen to you. Well, yeah, but I'm, I'm telling you, Alex, we're seeing, since my Alpha 21 came out, we're seeing a groundswell of, of not these elitists that, we're, that you're talking about, the people at the, in the so-called leadership roles, because remember something, black leaders do not represent black people in America any more than our so-called white leaders represent white people in America. There is this disconnect. Uh, between the between the leaders and the people they're supposed to uh, serve, um, and I, what I'm seeing is that a lot of blacks are starting to wake up to this and say, you know, I've always been suspicious about some of these things, this eugenic stuff, and why all the Planned Parenthood facilities are in our neighborhoods, and and uh, they're starting to wake up to this, and they're starting to see that uh, many of their leaders, just like we're seeing in the white community, many of their leaders have sold them down the river. Mark Crutcher is our guest. We're going to come back from break and give him the floor to get into his film, How Eugenics Was First Tested Out on Black People. The first IBM computer was uh, to track blacks. Uh, and, uh, of course, we cover all that in my film, Endgame, Blueprint for Global Enslavement, which uh, Mark years ago told me influenced his great film, Amafa 21, Black Genocide in the 21st Century America. You need to get this out to every American you know, black, white, Hispanic, it doesn't matter. We're all being targeted. Mark Crutcher, who made the incredible documentary film, Black Genocide in the 21st Century, Maafa, or Maafa, uh, M-A-A-F-A, -A, a documentary film, Maafa 21. This is a short segment, long segment coming up. We'll get into more uh, contemporary examples of this. But uh, tell folks about the film, which, by the way, is available at Infowars.com. If folks want to get the film, wake folks up, 
support your great ministry, support our work. The, the, the film is available at Infowars.com for folks that want to get it. But, Mark, break down uh, what the film covers. Well, basically, we start, uh, we wanted to show people what the real origins of legalized abortion were. Uh, the American people have been sold this idea that, that abortion is about women's rights and privacy and reproductive freedom and choice and all this basically sales pitches that we hear all the time. The reality is that the legalization of abortion was just the, the latest tool in a string of eugenics tools that were used to wipe out the African-American race in America. And it, I know this sounds strange, but I think we do a good job of connecting the dots from the days before the end of slavery right up to today. We started with that premise that, that we would go backwards from legalized abortion. What was the motive behind it? What drove it? And where we ended up going backwards was in the days... But that's not strange. That's where the first gun control in this country came from, was after Emancipation Proclamation. They said, we can't have blacks having guns. That's right. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I went to a, a showing of Alpha 21 in Arizona uh, when I was out there giving a speech not too long ago. And a, a black gentleman came up to me afterward, and he said, I, I had to come see this, he said, because it reinforces a lot of things I'd heard about it. And he said, it reinforces a lot of things that I'd always thought. He said, now, my particular issue is Second Amendment. And he said, did you know that the original gun control laws in this country were, were enacted to keep blacks from getting guns? And I said, well, I, I had heard that, but I said, I haven't studied. I can't say that, I, that I'm an expert in that field. He said, well, I am, and I can tell you absolutely that is the origin of, of gun control laws in America. And he said, so this idea that the origin of abortion and the origin of eugenics started with the effort to wipe out the black community is, is not strange at all to me. He said, it's not even remotely far-fetched. It makes perfect sense. The thing, he said, the things that I saw in this film tie up a lot of loose ends for me and, and explain a lot of things that I never understood. Well, that's exactly what's going on. And, and up until even the 80s, there was still secret forced sterilization going on. And, you know, whatever's tested the black community has then moved out, you know, uh, against everybody. And I, my research has gotten into the Rockefeller Foundation now with uh, uh, hormones added to vaccines. We have the total proof of that. Bisphenol A to reduce fertility. They are going after everybody uh, in this system. Yeah, and... and you know, uh, we, we have a segment in um, IFA 21 about the, the link between the American eugenics movement and the Nazi. And basically, the, the Nazi eugenics program originated with the United States. I mean, uh, Madison Grant, who is, who is one of the head of leaders of the, uh, the American Eugenics uh, Society, wrote a book with that Adolf Hitler called His Bible. And it was about creating basically the master race. And Adolf Hitler referred to Madison Grant's book as his Bible. And he repeatedly said that his heroes and the people that he looked to for guidance um, for his eugenics programs in, in Nazi Germany were all American and a few British, but mostly American. Um, we also have to understand that Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in, in Europe, in Germany, that was the place where all the eugenics uh, models were designed for Nazi Germany or for Nazi-occupied Europe, um, was actually funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Carnegie Foundation. So all of this, all of these links between the Nazis and the and the American eugenics movement, um, most people have no idea that this that this was going on. But in reality, it was. We were not we were not clean in this situation. I can assure you. Well, it's so important to get this film out to everybody uh, because it gets even more sophisticated. Uh, if you look at the model, and, and we've got all the documents, we've published them, we've covered them in previous shows. I've got Aaron popping in later uh, with us a little bit, uh, Mark, to, 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 to go over some of this. But if you go back to the 20s and 30s, as you know, they said, we've got to have the state break up the family. We're going to start with blacks. We're going to pay the women not to have a man in the house. Then we can institutionalize their males like they'd done Native American males. And we can then totally destroy these people. Then they put the blacks in the prisons. They turn into gangbangers. Uh, then the society totally degenerates. They come out and push music and messages that destroy the black family. Now that model's used against everyone. We'll talk about that when we come back. This is how they destroy a group of people. And they're doing it to all of us, by the way, folks.
We'll be right back. Stay with correction to make. For many years on Access TV in Austin, I've watched uh, their television show, and it's in a radio studio. Well, it's radio mics and radio headphones and look like radio to me, and so I, and I knew it was on in Dallas. Uh, so I was saying radio show. It's a TV show, but shot in what looks like a radio format. Find out more at uh, LifeDynamics.com. Of course, Mike Crutcher, very well known. And, and, and listen, we've got... Uh, what's, what's that, Jaron? Yeah, yeah, Mark Crutcher uh, is our guest, and we've got Aaron Dykes popping in uh, here in just a moment. Uh, but, but why do I go back over eugenics so much? Why do I talk about it, even though we've got all of this news and all of this information in front of us? Why do I spend almost every day at least 30 minutes on this? Because, ladies and gentlemen, and we got Aaron popping in in a moment, we have read, it's got to be conservatively, over 100 books written by them. And these are the heads of the UN, the heads of UNESCO, you know, the IMF chiefs, the British royalty, the Dutch royalty, uh, the mainstream news articles about how they have secret meetings and it's about population reduction. This is what they're obsessed with. This is what governs what they're doing. This is why they're coming out with vaccines that sterilize you whether you like it or not. This is why they're putting things in the GMO crops that are engineered in every major study to sterilize rodents, having the same effect on humans. Cancer doubling the last decade. Diabetes doubling. This is a big deal. This is a lot more important than Dancing with the Stars. And uh, going back to our guest, uh, I mean, look at this news uh, that I've got uh, here today. Beckham's a bad example for families with a fourth child. The couple have joined the ranks of the irresponsible population experts say. Uh, and then meanwhile, Ted Turner has five kids, all these big houses. Al Gore's got all, you know, this giant carbon footprint, the British royal family, their own trains, jets, yachts. Uh, the, the, the Rothschilds pushing this. These folks just want the earth to themselves. W what's your view and take on that and how they're attacking the family? Well, we had a uh, story that we covered on Live Talk here a couple months ago uh, in England where uh, there's this group of people that are, that are uh, advocating that people are saying that people who have children are irresponsible and may be criminal because of the carbon footprint that every child creates on the earth. And they're actually saying that people who, if you, if you slip up and, and end up pregnant, that the only responsible thing to do is have an abortion. And it, it is, you're, you're right about one thing, the hypocrisy of this is breathtaking. Because you, you have these, these hypocrites like, like Al Gore coming up here, out here talking about the carbon footprint, while he has a personal carbon footprint that's as much as some small town. And yet... No one calls him to task for that. And, and it goes back to what I said earlier. These people, the, what I call the money to lead in this world, they consider the earth their playground. And the rest of us are just allowed here as we provide services. And, and we're kind of the servile class. And whatever we can do to support them is fine, and we're, and we're tolerated to that extent. But beyond that, uh, like I said, this is their, this, the earth belongs to them. And they are the god of this earth. Well, Mark Crutcher, I have got, gotten the, the textbooks going back over 100 years. I've shown them on air. We've, we've made special reports, you know, with the material where they openly said, we're going to destroy the family. We're going to put folks on welfare so they're dependent. Through education, we're going to lower the test scores and make people regurgitate information instead of actually having critical thinking. I've, I've interviewed the former head of policy, Department of Education in the 80s, where this was admittedly... Uh, the goal, uh, the, the, you know, the lower down people didn't know. And they talk in these documents about the family being an anachronism, uh, archaic, that needs to be eradicated. And again, we see the model being blacks. What, 50 years ago, they had less than 50% illegitimacy? And, and, then, and I'm not bashing single parents, folks, but the point is that you have three times a chance of being in prison, or even higher when that happens. And with blacks, it's gone from below 50 to over 90 percent now. And, 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 and the system just completely brainwashes and sells a culture of total criminality to black people. Yeah, and, and they basically have, have set blacks up for failure. Um, they have created an environment in which they, and, and I agree with something you said earlier, white liberals in this country hate blacks. Contrary to what they're going to tell you out in public, 
they hate the black race. And I think that they have set up a situation that was specifically de decided uh, as a way to get rid of blacks. And, you know, I I'll tell you another group that has been uh, victimized by this. A few years ago, I went to uh, do a speech in South Dakota, and we were driving between Pierre, South Dakota, and Rapid City, South Dakota, and I saw a sign for an uh, Indian reservation. And I, and I had never, even though I'm right here in North Texas, and, you know, there's Indian reservations not far from here, I had never been on one. I thought, well, I'm going to go, what does this look like? And so we got off the road, and we had some extra time, and drove down this, this little two-lane blacktop road and finally came to this Indian reservation, which is basically just a small little town. It was the saddest thing that I have ever seen in my life. Um, and it, it is a, if you go to one of these Indian reservations and you see the level of alcoholism and the level of the poverty and all the other social and cultural problems that exist in, on these reservations, what you're looking at is the, is the design of white liberals. And what white liberals have done to the American Indian the Native American, is far more criminal than anything that was done to them prior to the, to the modern times. And I think that that's the model that they're, that they're using in the African-American race, and now they're really branching out to go after Hispanics, as Hispanics have now become the second most, uh, the second most populous uh, race in America. And Mark, let me stop you there. In my film, Endgame, Blueprint for Global Enslavement, that is an excellent complimentary film to MAFA 21, Black Genocide of the 21st Century, we have a clip from a Texas legislative meeting with the head of the state of Texas psychiatry board being questioned by the representatives, and they say, why are 68% of foster children on an average of seven psychotropic drugs? And he says they have bad gene pools. And that's what CPS says when they come take poor white children, black children, Hispanic, statistically to uh, situations five times more dangerous than home, but with no oversight over government. And he went on to say that they basically are defective humans. Eugenics is their operating mode. And if you talk to a quote white liberal and say, we need to stop aborting all these black people, they say, are you gonna adopt these blacks when statistics show there are folks that wanna adopt the blacks. In fact, more people want to adopt than there are even blacks being killed. Then they have black liberal groups come out and block whites or Hispanics adopting blacks, and that's being foundation funded by the eugenicists. They want those blacks dead. So it is racism to want to save black babies and God forbid raise them with whites because then that would unify people instead of folks being against each other. This is so diabolical. Well, let me tell you, I. As we were doing my Alpha 21, and, and as you know, in doing something like this, a lot of times some of the best stuff winds up on the cutting room floor. Um, and I can tell you that one of the, you start picking up on, on trends and, and attitudes and, and things, and it became crystal clear to me that since the beginning of this eugenics movement that started, like I said, right before the end of, of slavery in America, um, this moneyed elite in the world has consciously tried to keep black people and white people and Hispanic people fighting with each other. Because as long as we were fighting with each other, we weren't seeing what the government was doing and what the money the elite were doing. And they had a vested interest in keeping us all at each other's throat. And I think the, the, the hope for all of this is that is when whites and blacks and Hispanics start talking to each other and saying, you know, wait a minute, something's not right here. I wasn't born hating you. Where did this all come from? And, I, and I'm telling you, I, I don't know how much studying you've done on the on the Third Reich, but one of the one of the tricks that Hitler used was to keep all his top people fighting with each other, because Hitler was scared to death that if these people don't hate each other, they'll eventually join forces and come after me. No, so, he would play them off against each other. Absolutely, he kept he kept every he made sure everybody there hated everybody else and didn't trust them. And in a, in a sense, that's what the money to elite in this world has been doing for the last 150 years. They've been trying to make sure that black people and white people and now Hispanic people don't trust each other, hate each other, and don't speak to each other. And, and 
Well, that's called divide and conquer. Absolutely. And then, the, and then all the leadership of the groups that represent the white groups, the black groups, the Hispanic groups, the Asian groups, you track them back to the very same Rockefeller, Carnegie, Bill and Melinda Gates foundations where the leaders are funded by them. And so they will then do whatever the leaders say, even though they're eugenicist operatives. That's why a liberal black person will defend, and so will a white, more than half of blacks never being born because that's now a liberal sacrament and you are a racist for not wanting black people dead. That, that's it in a nutshell. And of course it makes no sense, but, but they know through tribalism, through divide and conquer, that's exactly what's going on. Uh, Mark, I want to bring Aaron Dykes in here, one of our great researchers at Infowars.com in a moment. But what are some of the other facets of MAFA 21 that, that uh, people need to understand? And why is it important this film be shown? Well, first off, I think one of the most, and, and you know, Alex, I, I've always thought when you do a project like this, when you're doing research, if you don't learn as much as you eventually teach, then it was a failure. And I can tell you that I learned things in, in, doing, the, in doing MAFA 21 that I never knew before. I've been in the pro-life movement for 30 years, and, and there were things about it that I didn't know that I found out. One of those was that the original groups in America who were opposed to abortion were, were not the Catholic Church or any of the pro-life groups that, that, that we all know so well today. It was actually the Black Panthers, the Nation of Islam. It was the radical 60s civil rights groups who saw, this was before abortion was legalized, but they saw that, the, that white liberals pushing for the legalization of abortion was an instrument that was going to be used to wipe out the black race. They saw that clearly. And we need to understand this is part of this thing of keeping us all divided. Because when you start looking at, say, some of these 60s, the radical 60s civil rights groups, you think, well, the, the antithesis of that is white conservatives. When in reality, we have a lot more in common than you might think. And when you sit and talk with some of these guys, and I, and I had a, a very unique experience here one day with a guy just literally walked up and knocked on our door and wanted to come in and talk. And um, he's in his 60s now. He was one of the founders of the Black Panther Party in North Texas. And he had seen MAFA 21 and saw that it was made here in Denton, so he, he lives here in Denton, and he came over to talk. One of the most interesting conversations I've ever had in my life, we talked for probably two and a half, three hours. And it was amazing to me to hear how many things that he talked about in the civil rights movement in the 60s were so similar to the pro-life and pro-family movement that we have today and how some of the, the things that we had to fight against, that we had to fight against today, they had to fight against back in the 60s. It was the exact same phenomenon, and they were treated the same way by the, by the government. They were treated the same way by the media, the the perception, I, I had this discussion with someone in the pro-life movement not long ago, and I said, he said, well, all these 60 civil rights groups uh, were XXX, and he, he you know, had these preconceived ideas about them. I said, well, where did you get that information? I said, who, who, who gave you that particular view of these groups? And he said, well, it's just what I read and heard. And I said, so the media gave it to you? And he said, well, yeah, I guess so. And I said, what do you think the perception is among people today in America of the, of the pro-life movement? And where do you think they got that perception? The media gave it to them. Well, let me expand. They also promote counterfeits, just like true constitutionalists founded the Tea Party in support of Ron Paul four years ago. The Republican Party two years ago openly came in, co-opted the name, and tried to take it over. It's the same thing. They do this every time. A absolutely. And so, and I, and I told this, this friend of mine not long ago, I said, look, if, if, you, don't, if you don't want to accept the media's portrayal of you as a pro-lifer, then don't just automatically accept the media's portrayal of this man here in Denton because he formed the Black Panthers here in, in North Texas. And the perception that you have of him came from the same people who you now say are liars about the pro-life movement. It's the same group of people. Well, also, they take unstable people from all these groups and then give them attention. And just like a lot of black leaders that are radical turn out to be closet feds, most white supremacists like Hal Turner and others turn out to be feds. It's all part of their divide and conquer strategy. That's why I have the ADL Southern Poverty Law Center attacking me on one end and then the Nazis attacking me on the other because it's all the same crew and that's come out over and over again. I wanna bring Aaron Dykes in, one of our researchers. We've got a shot here of the molecular vision of life 
Uh, we've got all these eugenics publications put out by the eugenics group. We have the former head of UNESCO, a book about evolutionary studies about Aldous uh, Huxley's uh, brother, Julian Huxley, where they admit eugenics is their religion. Aaron, chiming in on this discussion, uh, you know, researching this, uh, I mean, is eugenics not the heart of the, of the New World Order's uh, religion? It is absolutely at the heart of that, and I think it's tied directly in with their quest for centralization for a world state. Uh, and I think that really ties in with the value of labor uh, in terms of, I think what's really interesting in MAFA 21, I haven't seen it uh, in about over a year, so I hope I'm not misquoting, but he talks about how they were happy to have population grow under slavery with the black community uh, because they could use them to work in the fields, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But once slavery was ended, they had an incentive to decrease the population thus the era of uh, proper eugenics. And now the globalist and all their publications, you've got some of those, I wanna impart this information to our guest because he's influential, Mark Crutcher. Now they write because of robotics and industrialization, they don't need any of us and that's why they have the headlines, why the future doesn't need us. Well, that's the other thing about slavery at the same time that was happening was the culmination of the industrial- The cotton revolution. gin, all of it. And the Industrial Revolution ended in the monopolies that we see today amongst the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the Fords, et cetera, et cetera. And those people have been looking to further centralize us. And yeah, the rise of technology has further devalued the price of human labor, the value of it, uh, to the point where they talk about openly killing us or using propaganda or psychological or biological techniques or all of the above. And you're reading from their, their plans and expanding so on that. the birth rate or they'll keep us as pets, as kind-hearted liberals, just as George Brown. And by the way, you have the actual quotes from him there. You're reading from Bill Joy, the owner of Sun Microsystems there. Yeah, he's quoting Ted Kaczynski, who was talking about the new Luddite challenge. Uh, the Luddites, you know, revolted against the Industrial Revolution, devaluing human labor, uh, whether they're right or wrong. Now we face a new challenge with technology, as they've continued to centralize society to take over entire countries, entire regions, uh, steer them and control what's And that's on. what environmentalism is about, not the earth. It's about teaching you you're bad, you're worthless to take on this group guilt so you will then allow them to bring in a post-industrial world and eventually euthanize you. We're going to come back with our guest. The system, the belief system that drives the ruling class of the world, including the communist Chinese, where they have forced abortions. And now forced abortions being promoted here in North America. It's being promoted in England and Europe. And they have your children in the public schools. They are teaching them that families are bad, your parents are bad. I've read you the quotes here. It is outrageous that we're allowing this to go on. I wanna go back for the rest of this segment, the next to Mark Crutcher of um, lifedynamics.com, who made the excellent film, Mafia 21, Black Genocide in the 21st Century. We have it comboed at infowars.com with in-game blueprint for global enslavement that gives you the full spectrum of what's going on. Uh, but a lot of folks will say, ah, so what? There are too many people. Remember, you're being targeted as well, idiots. For those of you out there that giggle and laugh about this and kind of fantasize that you're part of the ruling elite because you buy into this. Uh, Aaron, uh, I want Mark to comment on some of your research, but get into some of the other quotes. I mean, when they say it's a religion, that's in the book put out by the Eugenic Society, worshiping uh, the founder of transhumanism, who said he changed the name to transhumanism because eugenics was unpopular after Hitler. Yeah, that's true, and uh, we're talking about Julian Huxley, the brother of Aldous Huxley, who was the first head of UNESCO, part of the United Nations steering group to centralize everything and take control of the entire life process. That's really what it comes down to. And he talks about, uh, first they quote a Dean Inge, who says, eugenics is capable of becoming the most sacred ideal of the human race, as a race, one of the supreme religious duties. And then Julian Huxley says in his 1936 Galton lecture, I agree entirely with him. Once the full implications of evolutionary biology are grasped, eugenics will inevitably become part of the religion of the future or whatever complex of sentiments may in the future take the place of religion. And they admit that uh, they can change any genetics they want. I mean, these are the people destroying the environment. 
with GMO mosquitoes released, fish with dozens of other animals in them, all sorts of genetic scourges already happening. And they talk about, well, it's like Ray Kurzweil. He says, I don't believe in God yet. I'm going to be God. These people, and by the way, the, 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 the Wedgwoods, the Galtons, the Huxleys, the uh, Darwins all intermarried and believed in the 1860s it would make supermen. Within two generations, hardly any of them, we, we cover the numbers in Endgame, almost all of them died or were completely retarded. And so the ones that lived, I mean, you look at the Huxleys and folks, they work crazy, mad hatters, just like royalty from Egypt on interbreeding. Your comments on uh, that, Mark Crutcher? Well, yeah, and, you know, you, you mentioned Galton. Francis Galton is, is now considered to be the father of, of modern eugenics. He's the guy who actually coined the word eugenics. It, that word did not exist before Francis Galton made it up. And what a lot of people don't know about Francis Galton was that he was – Charles Darwin's first cousin. And you're talking about people who were avowed racist. Darwin and Galton both wrote that Africans uh, and blacks and, and uh, aborigines, which we didn't have aborigines in the United States, but that they were basically indistinguishable from the highest form of primate, which they said was the gorilla. And if you read uh, Darwin and Galton's writings, what they said was that the way to make the human race better was to get rid of the, of the humans that were closest to the apes. Well, sir, just two years ago, the head of the IBM Human Genome Bioweapon Program, you know it as the Human Genome Project, had to resign when he said blacks weren't human. Uh, and I mean, the point is, though, that, and they're not just for people that are racist out there. They're not just targeting black folks. They're targeting because they're not just saying they want to kill people they see as inferior. They also want to kill the bad sons, uh, northern Europeans that aren't under their control. Have you run into that research, uh, Mr. Crutcher? No, I haven't. But we, we concentrated on, on the area uh, involving African-Americans because I think that what they did with African-Americans is they wanted to, to prove a, a philosophical point. And then once you make the philosophical point that you can make the human race better by getting rid of one particular group, once you've done... Once stay there, stay there. Back. ...information to the stars about this stuff, where they call the populations they're going after targets. How they say we got to get government health care in place so then we can force people to have sterilization and abortion for access to health care. That's what government health care is about. The Nazis had that. And all the same systems are being brought back, but it's liberal and trendy. Uh, Mark uh, Crutcher, you were trying to make a point before we hit that break. Yeah, what I'm saying is that I think that the eugenicists uh, in the 1850s, 1860s decided that blacks could basically be a test case. It, they, they wanted to get rid of them, of course, but um, they had made their fortunes on the backs of these slaves, and now they, thought they saw them as a potential financial drain, so they wanted to get rid of them. But from a from a practical standpoint, I mean, a pragmatic standpoint, I think they saw them as a test case. And they're saying, look, if we can make the human race better by getting rid of these blacks, then once we've got the American people or the, or the people of the world to accept this philosophy, then there's no reason that it has to stop at just blacks. It could be Hispanics. It could be poor whites. It could be Italians. It could be you know, Asians, it could be Chinese. It could whatever. be David Beckham, because if David Beckham and Victoria Beckham can't have children, well, you can't either. Absolutely. And so that's why it was so important to them to establish this principle. And the, and the main target that they selected initially was the African-Americans. Uh, I want to get Aaron in here to, to uh, add to that, Aaron. Uh, the only place I disagree is that they started doing that worldwide starting in the early 50s. The Population Council was then founded by John D. Rockefeller III, uh, who started these programs all around the world in nearly every third world country. That's a RAND Corporation report in your little hand there. This is a RAND analysis of that, the origins and evolution of family planning programs in developing countries. So you got the Rockefeller Population Council mixed with UNESCO, and I've read the documents there, too, where they analyze the countries, the type of government. If they're centralized enough, they go for an authoritarian approach to birth control and, quote, family planning. Chinese style, yeah. Yeah, Chinese style forced abortion. Well, you got Julian Huxley saying it's a global government religion, and he's the founder of UNESCO.
Yeah, and they were it's only a few hundred scumbags. And they talk about how to plant the messages in media, radio, television, films. They spend billions and everything. Oh, no, I mean, that's why an average woman sterilized by bisphenol A, all screwed up, breast cancer, you name it, will defend the system and say there's too many people. As they're murdering her, they feel like they're part of the establishment. Mark, do you run into that a lot where the people uh, who, who defend this, you know, uh, you know, think it's really cool? I find it means more avaricious than that. And a, and a classic example of this is Jesse Jackson. In the 1960s, Jesse Jackson was one of the people who was most outspoken against legalized abortion and the spread of birth control clinics in, in, in uh, minority neighborhoods. And he was, I, I mean, I've got quote after quote. We've got a few of them in my office 21, but we have found just dozens of things that he wrote in which he talked about this very issue, that they're going to use birth control and abortion to wipe us out. But the moment he decided that he wanted to run for president of the United States, and he saw that the Democratic Party was, was under the thumb of these, uh, of these eugenics people, um, he switched his, his tune. I mean, literally, this man went from one day saying, literally, that abortion and the legalization of abortion and, birth con and the spread of birth control is specifically designed to wipe out the black race to a few days later saying the greatest civil rights issue of our time is a woman's right to choose. And the only thing that changed was he decided he wanted to be president, and he needed the money that these eugenicists would bring to the table. And then they wrecked the black communities with social engineering and say, see, we need to get rid of these people. Uh, and, 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 and then they set the paradigm for now we got to get rid of everybody because everybody's an evil carbon polluter, as Bill Gates has said. So they're uh, moving on now to the general population. Mark Crutcher, the film, Moffa 21, available at InfoWars.com. Thank you so much for joining us today, sir. Well, thank you for having me on and call anytime, Alex. You bet. Look forward to speaking to you again soon.